Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the second day of the reading of Homemade Magic. If you'd like to get in and hear the whole thing, then just scroll down my page and listen to yesterday's uh, uh, installment, and then you'll be all caught up. It is a drizzly, chilly morning here in Costa Mesa, and I just got back from my morning, uh, my morning walk to get my uh, blood flowing. Anyway, uh, there's a couple pictures that go with uh, today's uh, today's reading, and instead of me trying to hold them up here and let you see them, uh, I've posted them uh, right here on my Facebook page. Uh, there's just two of them. Uh, and I refer to the page number that uh, where they appear, and I've uh, written out the the caption or the legend that uh, goes with each of those pictures. So yesterday uh, I read the prologue, the prologue dedication uh, called Nebraska Maids. There, that's better. Uh, and today is chapter zero. The rant of a homemade magician. Doing magic is not what magic is about. The goal of magic is to be a magician. That's the little epigram there. I believe I'm quoting myself. I'm not altogether happy with the title I've chosen for this book. It, and to tell you the truth here, let me digress. Uh, uh, the new edition that we're working on right now, uh, the title may uh, change or the subtitle may, may change. So uh, a little bit anyway. We'll always know it's homemade magic. Anyway, I'm not altogether happy with the title I've chosen for this book. It's a bit misleading because ultimately all magic is an intensely personal endeavor, by definition, homemade. Of course, a person can be formally trained or at least educated in one or more of the classic magical systems, such as Kabbalistic, Wiccan, Druid, Native American, Solomonic, Enochian, etc. Or one can be part of a highly structured and formal uh, formally structured uh, magical group or mystery school, such as a coven or a lodge of esoteric masons, uh, the Golden Dawn, Servants of Light, or Ordo Templi Orientis, OTO. One might even be lucky enough to be privately tutored by an experienced and illuminated magical adept. But as magicians, indeed as human beings, we have only one universe in which to work and only one universe with, excuse me, we have only one universe in which to work and only one universe with which to work. I believe I'll, I'll restate that again and fix it. We have only one universe to, in which to, uh, in which to work, and only one universe to work with. That's how I want to do it. We're we're seeing the editing process in action here. Okay, with note to editor. Okay. And that universe is ourselves. <laughs> no matter what your circumstances may be, when it comes time to perform real magic, your magic can only be executed by, for, and through the agency of you alone. The most I can hope to accomplish in writing this book, or a book of this nature, is to share a few scattered accounts of my own life and magical career 
and encourage you to consider how my experiences might best be translated and applied to the unique circumstances of your own life. To that end, I think it'd be helpful if I started by giving you a quick review of my background and current magical milieu. I was born July 11th, 1948, in Long Beach, California. And uh, the footnote is I'm 65 years old at the time of this writing, so that was 12 years ago. Uh, yeah, I'm 72 now. I moved with my parents and older brother to Columbus, Nebraska in 1956 and returned to Southern California after high school graduation in 1966. I became a professional musician at the age of 14 and made my living as a songwriter and recording artist through my mid-20s. I've been married to Constance since uh, 1967. We have one son, Jean-Paul, who is a university professor in Japan. Uh, he's now a university uh, uh, teacher in uh, Macau, China. I speak English and only the faintest fragments of French and Spanish. This means that my entire education, magical and otherwise, has been acquired from texts written or translated into the English language. I quit college. I was pretending to be a drama major. After only one year and, studying at, and studied acting for a short time at the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute in Hollywood. I hold no academic degrees. A series of psychedelically triggered mystical experiences in 1966 through 1971 led me to preliminary yoga instructions, to seek preliminary yoga instructions, and I also dabbled in various meditation techniques and practices of Eastern mysticism at Paramahansa Yogananda's Yogananda's Self-Realization Fellowship, and the Vedanta Society. From 1971 to 1975, I studied via correspondence instruction several uh, or aspects of the Western mystery traditions through the Rosicrucian Order Amorc, the Builders of the Aditum, B-O-T-A, and the traditional Martinist Order, T-M-O. Around this time, I became passionately interested in the written works of Aleister Crowley. In 1975, I met Grady Lewis McMurtry, also known as Hymenaeus Alpha 777, and his then wife, Phyllis Seckler McMurtry, also known as Soror, Soror Merrill, who initiated me into two of Crowley's magical organizations, Ordo Templi Orientis, OTO, and AA. Before Crowley's death, the McMurtrys had both been disciples of Aleister Crowley. Grady had received the OTO's highest initiatory degree directly from Crowley in England, and Phyllis had been the personal student of Crowley's acolyte, Jane Wolfe. The McMurtrys, in turn, introduced me to Francis Israel Regardi, former secretary to, to Crowley, and celebrated occult author in his own right. And just to clarify things, because it didn't clarify it very well here, uh, uh, Grady McMurtry and Phyllis McMurtry initiated me into the OTO, uh, and Phyllis Seckler became my AA contact. In 1976, I was passed to the next degree in OTO in Dublin, California. Assisting the McMurtrys in this ceremony was Helen Parsons Smith, another Crowley contemporary and widow of both Wilfred T. Smith, former OTO North American Grandmaster, and John Whiteside Jack 
Parsons. Parsons had been an eminent rocket scientist and developer of jet-powered takeoff and solid rocket fuel. And you see a fictionalized account of his life in the recent uh, television series uh, Strange Angel. Very fictional. He was one of the founding members of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the forerunner of NASA. This brilliant magician scientist was posthumously honored by the Space Agency for his contributions to the program by having a crater on the moon named for him. It's on the dark side. In 1978, I was authorized by Grady McMurtry to establish and operate a lodge of OTO in Southern California, and I remain its lodge master to this day. In 1996, I was appointed U.S. National Deputy Grand Master of OTO by McMurtry's successor, Hymenaeus Beta. And then there's that picture there that's... I'll let you read the caption uh, on my Facebook page. Throughout the years, I have supported myself and my family in a number of ways. I was a singer-songwriter and a recording artist in the late 60s and early 70s, and afterwards held a string of low-paying positions in manufacturing, property management, and advertising all of which allowed me quite a bit of flexibility to pursue my personal magical studies and practices. In 1988, Constance and I initiated Dr. Christopher S. Hyatt uh, into our OTO Lodge. And over the next few years, he and I collaborated on a number of writing projects that opened up an exciting new chapter in my magical and professional life. So there you have it. In the last 40 years, my homemade magical career has included a lot of work with various spiritual disciplines and systems, instructors, and magical orders. I'll be the first to admit that I've been very lucky. And my experiences are most likely very different from your own. But you'd be gravely mistaken if you believe that because my life and background are in some ways different from yours, it means that you are somehow at a disadvantage in your work as a magician. Like it or not, the cards you've been dealt in life make up exactly the hand you need to play. To be a magician, you do not need to be the personal student of an adept. And you do not need to belong to any magical order or society. You are and always will be your own universe. You are a homemade magic school with one teacher and one student. You are an entire mystical order of one. And even if someday you happen to come under the tutelage of some great master, or even if you join and become an adept of a powerful occult order, you'll still be facing the exact same obstacles and challenges you are facing right now. You'll still be required to do all the magic yourself. You'll remain forever a solitary practitioner. This is not to say that all of us are not influenced and affected by others, or that our actions, thoughts, and behavior don't affect our environment. If other people are healed or gain a level of enlightenment as a byproduct of your self-realization and self-transformation, that's great. But ultimately, you're a solo act. And your temple your workshop, your laboratory, and your universe are your own body, your own brain, and your own soul. Doing magic is not what magic is about. The goal of magic is to be a magician. 
The only thing the magician can actually change with magic is the magician. The only thing, oh, excuse me, the book is intended to be helpful and instructive, but you'll neither be helped nor instructed if you think you can accomplish the great work by blindly replicating magical operations exactly as described by me or anyone else. That's not how it works. Magic is a process, a step-by-step -step journey of self-directed, self-willed personal evolution. That process must take place within the context of whatever opportunities, liabilities, assets, obstacles, restrictions, and fortunes, good or ill, your life circumstances have given you and those that you make for yourself. You might be single or married. Your relationship status might be complicated. You might have children. You might have a corporate or professional job, or you might be an artist or a magician or a musician. You might be employed, unemployed, or retired. You might be independently wealthy or a penniless aesthetic. You might be socially and politically conservative or liberal. Your circumstances might even be such that you have to keep your magical interests a secret from everyone around you. Or you might be able to burst madly out of the wizard's closet in public. Whatever your situation, once you realize you're a magician, it'll be impossible for you to remove the magic from any aspect of your existence. What you do for a living will no longer just be a job, it'll be a magic job. Your relationships will be with magical beings. Your hobbies will be magic and your love life will be magic. Your likes, dislikes, fears, dreams, ambitions, and even shortcomings and vices will be magic. It's all magic because you never stop being a magician. In this book, I'll share a few examples of how I've made the magical arts an integral facet of my life. But in addition to that, and even more importantly, I'll try to offer you a few glimpses of how a magician interprets each and every seemingly mundane and unmagical event of everyday life as the magical adventure it truly is. I hope you'll be able to somehow apply my examples to the unique circumstances of your own life. Your homemade magical adventure begins when you first wake up to the fact that you're literally asleep. We will all wake up eventually. But what differentiates magicians from our sleepy neighbors is that we are ready and willing to jump start the waking up process. Formally and with full intent we stir from our slumbering stupor and declare to the gods, I'm waking up now. Let my journey begin. And that's the end of chapter zero. Tomorrow, chapter one. Who are you? Have a good week, everyone. And, uh, Enjoy the full moon. Continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.